Is there? Oh, yeah, I'm on screen. Right. And two screens. 
Uh, no, there was uh, the micro. The, the, the microphone. There was a microphone upstairs. Yeah. I don't know. Oh yeah, it's working. Yeah. Uh, is there one that can go on his lapel? That's, that's okay. I'll do it from here. Yeah. I'll do it. The thing is, it's going to be recorded. Yeah. And it's really, really useful if they can hear what you're saying as well. Yeah. So I'll stick close yeah. to the mic. Okay, cool. You're in charge here, are you? Okay. Good. Oh, you're my... Uh, he, he's... No, I'm just... I don't... <laughs> you're insistent. You're <laughs> insistent. We could yeah. have been even more... I could have been even more shit. Yeah. That's you doing an SSU. The, the last ten minutes yeah, but yeah, because we finished the quarter two. I suppose you could say to the one now, you might see this in some way, but we didn't talk about when projects go wrong. Your, the project for today, where you were going to talk about me as well. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> the location. Set up so I can see my slider oh, yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we need to go back to your desktop. Okay. And then we need to go to preferences. Um, where would that be on this? I'm not a big Mac user, you see. Okay, yeah, so system, system preferences. preferences. There we are. Yeah, for sure. And display, I think it's the one. And then we don't want to move this way. So that, you have a second monitor now. I get rid of all this. So if you want to drag this, oh. is this the one you'll be using? Yeah, that's the presentation, yeah, but I wonder if, I, I, I have no idea how I have two views, so I can see. That, that, that way then. So, <coughs> so this goes on to here, so this will be your first screen, you yeah. can do your notes, but you can um, my notes are in here. Yeah, but my notes are in here. Oh, yeah, yeah, my notes are in here. Oh, but, sorry. But, no, no, that's working. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. I see what, I see see what I'm in, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you want to go into presentation mode, which I'm not sure how to do on a Mac. Uh, go to view, I think. View, what, there? Yeah. Uh, uh, presentation well, I just mode. Got play. Let's see what that does. Where are we open? If you want to take over. Well, play, as far as I know, uh, just gives me... Hey! Well, I don't know the presentation oh, mode. Nice one. Well done, you. What a story. We got there in the end. It was yeah. teamwork. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Are you okay, Steve? No, no, no. Would you want to do the talk? Uh, pass. In terms of, in terms of microphones, um, you have this one, which is usually sufficient enough. That, you can turn that up on the thing here. Yeah, I, I, that'll be fine. And we can mute it if you want. And we also have ceiling microphones to record your um, recording, because you're live. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Are you okay? That's it. No, we're good. Do you need this? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, I'll take it. Okay. Okay, uh, everybody, I'll uh, get started. Uh, I'm getting started four minutes and 32 seconds late because stuff goes wrong with projects. Turned out I didn't read the manual properly and I was in the wrong room, but I'm here now. So uh, I am uh, from Codenigma. Uh, my name is Steve Curry. If you want to check me out on Drupal and find out just how old I am. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, what goes wrong in uh, projects. Uh, mostly what I'm talking about uh, is the kind of project where you have to fill out some kind of RFP or an ITT to actually get the work in the first place. Uh, so my assumption is that it's probably a project with a new client rather than a, a project with an existing client where you've already established a relationship. 
Uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about is the power of negative thinking. Uh, and uh, mostly I'll do that because uh, you might have picked up already I'm Scottish. Uh, and I was brought up in a strict Presbyterian upbringing. So my experience of life was that you lived somewhere it rained a lot and you knew that when you, were die when you died, you would be going to hell. So it kind of makes you feel a bit negative about stuff. Uh, for the rest of you here who are not like that, think about what I'm talking about as therapy. You can listen to it and say, that never happens in my organization. Uh, and then you can feel good about yourselves. Or you can listen to what I say and say, oh crap, <clears throat> that's happened to me too in which case you get the satisfaction of knowing it's not just you who gets things wrong. Uh, I will try and talk negative as I am about things you might be able to do about these things. Uh, and just for context, what got me thinking about this, apart from my uh, Scottish background, is uh, I was listening to something on the BBC a couple of years ago about the power of negative thinking. Uh, I think it's still available. Uh, uh, and it's uh, got very interesting examples of why negative thinking is a good thing. Uh, now, having talked about negative thinking and why everything goes wrong, and having shown you a slide of Code Enigma, I do not want you to think I'm talking about Code Enigma. I'm talking about a friend of mine who works in another agency. Everything I say, therefore, doesn't bear any relationship to any real people. But just in case I accidentally use the word we when talking about screw-ups, just remember, it's not Code Enigma. I'm talking about another company called Dulali Development. And you might also think, you might even record this and play it to our customers it's attempting to get business. So I'm not talking about any of our customers. Uh, I'm talking about a made up customer. So imagine I'm talking about the Ministry for Frictionless Trade. Because that <laughs> couldn't possibly happen, could it? So the kind of project experience I'm talking about is that sense that it starts off great and by the end of it, doesn't feel that great. Has anybody ever had that experience? You start off like this. You're going to conquer the world. This time, you're going to nail it. You're really going to deliver a transformative experience for your customer. You're going to make a profit. You're going to be a happy team. You're going to have a showcase that you show to the next customer. Your business is going to grow. You're going to be hiring. You're really going to be hiring, not just putting it up to say we're hiring. Uh, that's what you're hoping for. Brave new world. And it ends up like that. Uh, you've hit a massive discovered object, undiscovered object. Or it ends up like that. Not a total fail. You get over the line. But as you get over the line, you're utterly exhausted. So if you've ever had that experience, that's what I've been thinking about. How on earth does this happen? How on earth does it happen more than once? Because you should be able to have it at once, sure, and then fix it. So my theory is that projects really fail because of communication. That's the problem. Not talking about the technical stuff, just the communication. So as George Bernard Shaw has it, the single pro biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's actually taken place. In reality, we're all islands shouting lies to each other across seas of misunderstanding. I could stand here for an hour just putting up quotations like this. We've all observed it, but we don't know. One final one, just because you told them doesn't mean they heard, is, that's me, uh, I come up with it, come up against it again and again. So, if other people tell you something, you make assumptions. If they don't tell you something, we make assumptions. To fulfill our need to know, 
and replace the need to communicate. So we all basically start all the time are constructing narratives. And if we don't have the information, you can pretty much guarantee that you're constructing a false narrative and your narrative doesn't fit the narrative of your customer. And your narratives basically rewrite history. Dulali Developments worked with a product manager who started every sentence with the phrase, I thought we said. No, we never said that, but out it came. And a consequence of working uh, in this sea of misunderstanding and miscommunication is that you turn around to everybody and say, it's their fault. So if you've ever been in that situation where your customer is saying about you, it's their fault, they're useless. Meantime, your team is saying, customer, can't work with these people, they're useless. Why would this happen? Well, we basically start not really understanding each other. We're the supplier, we have a customer, there is some kind of nebulous requirement. I've used the dotted line to indicate nebulous. Uh, and we understand a bit of it, they understand a bit of it, neither of us understand all of it. That would be enough of scope for a problem, but thinking about the customer, I've done them as a circle. It's not one thing, the customer, is it? It's a bunch of different things, stakeholders we might call them. So that these are sample stakeholders, but even within these samples, they won't all be thinking the same thing. So if you go into a room and you meet eight people from your customer side of the, on the table, all eight of them will have a different concept of what it is you're there to do. Supplier, put that as a circle. Bunch of different interests in there. Design doesn't think what development thinks. Finance doesn't think what they think. The board doesn't think what finance thinks. Sales doesn't think what anybody thinks. Project management, don't even want to talk about project management. So what's actually going on here is people are just making assumptions. So let's have a think about all the assumptions that we make and our clients make as we start to engage at first. Assumption number one, we know why we are here. No, we don't. We've got an RFP, which is a work of fiction. Uh, it's a wish list assembled by a committee and approved by, I'm not gonna say, because you might think it was uh, a Code Enigma customer I was talking about, approved by somebody who doesn't really understand what they're approving. So we arrive, we don't know. It's incredibly difficult to get under the skin of an organization. You sure as heck don't know it when you arrive. Similarly, the customer knows why we're here. Uh, Anybody ever met a customer who knows sod all about web development? I haven't. Okay, there's always one heckler in the room. So, we've got, uh, we've got a problem that we, we start with this mis mis misunderstanding of what's actually going on. So, if we proceed on that basis, we're almost guaranteed to have trouble. So let's actually check what's going on. Uh, so a tool that I've uh, found particularly useful is a thinking instrument. I don't know if people have seen this, the double diamond design model. Uh, and uh, it basically uh, has two diamonds. The first is focused on designing the right thing and the second on designing the thing right. And it seemed, my experience is that in a lot of web projects, we kind of jump to the second triangle without even thinking about the first one. So we read the RFP and uh, it says, oh, we want personalization. So we put in a proposal about how you can achieve personalization. And we don't actually say, why on earth do you want personalization? Is that actually the right answer to your problem? So we don't pull it back and say, let's just investigate this before we even get started. Also, we're not clear, uh, as I say, why we're here or why the customer thinks we're here. Are we here as designers and we're going to change people's lives? Or 
we're going to, and we're going to help define their problem, shape it, transform everything. Is that what they've hired us for? Or are we just here as painters and decorators? And whatever vile wallpaper they've decided they need, we're going to put it up professionally, regardless of the color combinations, because the CEO likes orange and purple. Fine, we'll do it. So in that case, what's going on is the customers actually define their own problem, and we're just going to go along with it. We're going to build garbage, but we may be able to build the garbage on time because of uh, what they've defined. That's assumption. the first assumption, we know what, what we're doing. Second assumption, the customer understands what Drupal is. So we probably all know that using Drupal as a content management system where you can slap a bunch of things together completely breaks down the minute people actually want a really effective, responsive website design. So you can't actually do what you say you do with Drupal. The idea that it's Lego and you can make whatever you want no, not true. Uh, but if it's been sold to the customer on the idea that, oh, yeah, yeah, you can just plug in a module and you'll be able to do this extra thing, you're going to be in so much trouble down the line. We assume the customer actually understands how the web in general works. Uh, do they actually know anything about what's involved in creating a responsive design? that's capable of working on all the form factors that exist. And when a new form factor comes out next month, we'll be cap capable of working on that. And that's just one example of what they probably don't know about. Do they understand professional development? One of the things that I think is quite weird is usually the point about hiring professionals is you get stuff done quicker. So you go to the main dealer of the garage, and it should be that it get, they do it really quickly. They know what they're doing. They can do it really quickly. Actually, with web development, it almost sometimes feels like it works the other way around. By the time you throw in continuous integration and Git and multi-stage deployment and peer review and automated testing and four layers of testing, user acceptance testing, it kind of takes a day to get a block on the page. Uh, so actually, have they, do they realize what they've hired when they've hired you? Does the customer get that something's actually got to be done about the content? How many people are going to project? And they, there's some magic stage happens where a magic fairy comes in and they just take this garbage and they move it over there into your fantastic design and it works. Uh, are we talking the same language? So again, we make a bunch of assumptions about things that we take for granted probably in our world. And are we using the same project methodology? So, uh, word of warning for anybody, if you walk into a room to meet the client for the first time and there's a project manager, you're probably in trouble. Because they probably won't be thinking what you're thinking. Minimum viable product. Will they have any concept of what minimal vi minimum viable product is? They'll have a fixed budget more often than not. But minimum viable product will uh, mean very little to them. You're going to have to make them understand what minimum viable product is and make sure that senior stakeholders get it. So give them an exercise at the beginning. Make them throw 30% of the project features out so they get a hold of it. Just say, OK, when we hit a discovered task and uh, you tell me there's no more budget, which of these three out of ten things are we not going to do? And if they won't tell you, minimum viable product has become completely meaningless. And then we probably pitch it as, well, we work with the product owner to define the project, build a backlog and set priorities. Ho, ho, ho. Product owner might well just be the secretary that got dumped with this because nobody else can be bothered. Uh, Will they understand, do they actually understand whether they need one? Does that person have the authority to act? Does that person actually have the necessary knowledge to make decisions? Probably worst of all, do they have the time and the capacity to do it? Because they're already doing a job. So have they worked out that if this is a fairly sub substantial web project, they've got to stop everything else they were doing and just work with you? Chances are not. 
I mentioned discovered tasks already. Uh, so have we had a conversation with them that says, what happens when we hit this discovered task that we don't know about? And they will say, well, you're an expert. You should know about everything about us and our organization, our infrastructure, and this really weird p database connection that somebody built that we didn't know we had. You were supposed to know about all that stuff. I was thinking on back to the Titanic thing, the discovered task. I'm pretty certain that at some point between hitting the iceberg and sinking, there was a loud businessman uh, who was shouting at the crew saying, I don't care we hit some ice, I need to be in New York tomorrow. Faced with that, do they understand what we mean when we push back? One of the things that it seems to me will make a relationship really adversarial really quickly is the minute you start pushing back. But if you don't start pushing back from the beginning, you'll be stuffed because what will happen is you'll get to the end and you'll suddenly find there's six months worth of work to do and one month's worth of time to get it done in. So you've got to establish and explain to them, this is why we do this, because we're going to get a successful result for you. But if we simply go along with you, you will not get a successful result. Have we explained that small things are really hard? So show people this. Uh, this came up recently where uh, the client had been shown groups as a good way of organizing the website, built the website, and then groups like most Drupal modules use quite, uses quite a lot of kind of module-specific terminology. So there'll be a, a tab in there that says related references. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, we use groups. That sounds good. Can you take all those words out? Uh, yeah, so can you actually spend a week's worth of development time patching, rewriting, overwriting to try and make groups work? Oh, and can you fix it the next time there's a release for no money because you said it, Drupal does everything out of the box? Small things are hard. Show them so they understand what that means. What's a bug in a Drupal project? Make sure you get this one sorted. Uh, before you spend six months doing the project and the next six years servicing it for free because that what they see they define as a, bug, uh, as a bug. So make sure you've nailed it down. We talk a lot about, we can wrap quite a lot of these things up in this concept of the Iron Triangle, triangle which I'm sure most people would be aware of, that essentially you've got a number of constraints, value, quality, uh, cost, and you cannot move them. If you move one, it has an impact on the other two. You can drag it, but it will have an impact. Uh, so show the client uh, this and tell them, ram it home. You can only have two of these things. It can be good and cheap, it can be good and fast, it can be fast and cheap, but it cannot be all three of these things. That's impossible. They're asking for the impossible. But of course, a lot of the time you'd be thinking, oh, you wouldn't want to do this. It's a bit of a downer to meet the client and say, it's going to be a failure. So what you actually do is you say, no, no, it'll be good. All's the best and the best of all possible worlds, we will assume. So, oh, there's an API we have to integrate. All oh, right, really? Oh, it hasn't been written yet, but the people are really good. They'll have it ready for us in a couple of months. Uh -uh. Don't go with that. That's not. Assume the API is going to be a disaster. Don't start work until you've got the API, but don't set off saying it'll be fine, we'll kick that can down the road and pick up later. Do have a risk register. Do take this really seriously. So my experience of risk registers, and I guess everybody knows what they are, uh, you identify a risk and you score it and uh, you work out a mitigation. And uh, everybody does it really kind of dutifully at the beginning. But uh, what I've noticed is that mostly then it goes in the, it goes in the drawer. It doesn't come back out. Uh, the scores kind of don't actually really mean anything. Nobody revisits it. Really weirdly, the development team, very rarely, the management do this. So they sit in a room and they, oh, we're doing the risk register because that's what you ought to be doing. But the developers don't say, I've just spotted an enormous risk. Get it on the risk register. Make sure people look at it. 
think about having a pre-mortem at the beginning. If you're finding it hard to say, say, I spoke to the Scottish guy and he said it's a really good idea to think about all the worst things that can happen. Oh, so I just borrowed this slide. But the idea is right at the beginning, if people, if you use a generic risk register, everyone will just tend to ignore it. Say, yeah, 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 the risk register, we have to do that, but they'll ignore it. If you make them build it by thinking about everything that will go wrong, and you do that together with them, possibility is that you've got a shared risk register that you work through together. Ask yourselves, are we reviewing this? Who's actually reviewing it? What's the escalation process? If you don't have one, there's no point in having the risk register. So when a developer points out that the API that they've been given is not fit for purpose, who does it go to and how, what happens? Do we stop the project? Do we put more resources on it? Uh, if you've set off and you haven't asked these questions, the clients will just assume you'll just work harder and fix it for them. If we've actually addressed these things and, uh, as it were, rubbed our client's nose in the realities of doing this, uh, and they've still got us in the same room, uh, what we're now having is a conversation. By the way, the client might not have you in the same room. Good, walk, don't stay. If they don't want to hear about your world and they want to make their assumptions about how your world is, just leave. There are other places to get money, go find another client. But if they are having a conversation, even better, we're now managing the conversation and that's absolutely critical for how you're going to get an effective project. You have to manage it, you're the experts, your clients are not. You are the authority. You've established authority and you've got to hold on to that authority. So this is you. The client is, uh, it just shows one line here, but actually you should probably have about 10 of them arranged around to represent all the stakeholders. And it's your job to keep them on that stool at all times. The thing about this is, though, you've got to maintain the conversation. We've established a conversation. You're going to have to maintain this conversation because what's going to happen if that guy turns his head away for a minute? The line's going to happen. You've got to maintain the conversation all the time. Even if you've explained all the things that I've explained and the client has grasped some of them, the minute you're out the door, their grasping will start to just fade away and they'll go back to thinking what they thought before. Ah, it's, design's easy. My son can do it. Ah, uh, you've got to keep going back to that conversation and saying, going back to that risk register and saying, what are we doing about this? Has it happened? And if you've already established that when, when two or three risks, if you suppose, suppose you're using a metric of five for possibility and five for impact, and when you've got a risk score of 15, the project stops, you've already established that the client won't like it. But if you hadn't mentioned it, and you then halfway down the line towards launch, hit a point where the project has to stop, you're stuffed. They're just gonna think you're incompetent. Uh, just, uh, that uh, picture of the line, it came from what I found was a really interesting blog, actually, about the businesses supporting difficult customers, essentially explaining. So it's, it's worth a read, which is why I threw it in. Uh, so I'll go back to my point before. Just because you told them doesn't mean they heard. The worst thing you can do is assume, well, I sent them an email. Uh, no. No. Emails are not the way. Emails are a reasonable backstop communication. But the purpose of emails is basically so that if you end up in court, heaven forbid, uh, you've actually got some kind of evidence trail that you're maintaining. But as a means of actually communicating a difficult truth to somebody, they're utterly useless. Go see them. So that's the conversation with the client. The client is now carefully perched on the stool. I'm standing wearing my... Uh, lion tamer outfit, feeling very smug. Now I've got to start another conversation. So the another conversation I'm going to be having is with the team at Dulali Development. Uh, 
I've sold it to the customer, I'm managing the conversation, I'm looking around so they don't drift off when I'm not looking at them, but I've kind of got them where I need them to be. Now what am I going to do about the people I'm working with? In theory, they're also like a team of well-honed lions all working together to move in the right direction. Ha ha. Actually, uh, unless I have an internal contract with the people who are going to deliver the project, this is not how it's going to be. So when I've got no internal contract with people, uh, I have no real chance of getting a result. And what I mean by an internal contract is that we have to make a contract for what we will deliver for our customer. When you first start working on a project, customers aren't interested in things like time and materials, and this is how we work, and it's agile. Material. They want a result. We have to figure out what's the best possible result we can get for them and deliver them, and that's our internal contract. And we have to keep a hold of that internal contract all the time and always go back to it and check, are we uh, on, on, uh, in line for delivering it? Because really the contract is what it is the salespeople actually sold to the customer. So you've got a, one contract there, what the customer thinks they bought, and the other contract, what production, the, making, getting production to do this. So, things that go wrong in the internal contract. Well, no shared ownership. Dev says design got it completely screwed. Uh, both say sales got it completely screwed. Uh, the uh, UX people say that the graphic designers haven't got it. Everybody thinks the front-enders are clueless. Uh, this is how this goes. The dev team thinks that we're working on time and materials. The client doesn't. The client thinks we're working on a result. So what happens? Everybody starts chucking it over the fence. So sales, there you go, this is what we're having. Over to design, design. Oh, God, look at this, another piece of rubbish. There you go, make that developers look at it. Oh, for God's sake, what, you really seriously expect me? Okay, I'll make it. Oh, I can make that, I can make that, I can make anything. I don't, it's rubbish. Oh. So now, the, the conversation is their fault. We're all basically blaming each other. So here we are, our happy team at Dilali uh, development, basically in a mess and all but saying when confronted, it's not my problem, mate. So, when the uh, team are confronted, we go to design and we say, oh, the customer said it doesn't look right on IE on a tablet. And designer says, yeah. No. And then you go to the development team and say, Oh, we've forgotten about the microsites. And that's the response. And then we go to the back end, back end developers and say, oh, you've got to do it. And this is the response. So uh, everybody's fighting each other, basically. Uh, because we don't have an internal contract. Uh, we've wrangled our customer into the right place, but we haven't coalesced uh, ourselves. The point I'd want to make to people, and this is, uh, you know, this is pure opinion, frankly, but I'm right, uh, is it's, you should always be thinking that It's our fault. If you're thinking it's their fault, frankly, about anything in life, uh, but certainly web development, this isn't going to fix anything. If you're thinking it's our fault, there's a chance we're going to fix it. So, quote from an extremely wise person, uh, if you blame yourself, you learn something from it. You don't blame, learn anything from blaming other people. It's not, it's not your problem. 
you should always be thinking, what did we do wrong? How did we get this wrong? Uh, and then maybe there'll be some chance in the next project it won't be so bad. So that quote is uh, uh, Joe Strummer. And uh, I'm hoping I haven't depressed you too much because now we're done. So that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Want a counselling telephone number? You said um, if, um, you're trying to get over that point about small things can be really hard. Yeah. Show them. Yeah. Do you have a, a favourite case to show them to illustrate that? Well, I think uh, the, the one I mentioned, for example, of the... I mean, frankly, you could find the loads of them if, you, if you're doing Drupal development. But the one I mentioned about groups is a really good one. Uh, another one that I th I've seen time and time again is around language where people ask for uh, commerce, for example, uh, and you do Drupal commerce and all the language is ba very based around the American model and people really struggle with that and actually explaining to them. Weirdly, it looks like it ought to be really simple to just change that tab, but to be honest, it isn't. Uh, it's, so the, I think, but f you could find it in almost any situation where you're putting together Ah, I know a module that I can kind of make do that. Uh, it's not quite the right use case, but I can sort of make, we can kind of bend it and make it happen. So I think anything like that, and if you, if you basically then could give them the times and say, okay, out of the box means it's that, and you can have that, and it will cost you two hours of time. Changing it to this will take a week. So if you, let's say you're working on 500 pounds for a day for the sake of argument. Uh, I can give you this for 250, or you can have that for 2,500. That uh, would, would, would be the kind of example, I think, that would help people. Not so much of a question, but one, one of my experiences with Drupal is that you can do a huge amount of stuff by configuring various modules very quickly. But Uh, if your design is such that those modules need a lot of tweaking and prepping and whatever, you, your, your rate of progress can fall through the floor. In other words, if you design for what's easy, you can end up with a nice design and it works really quickly, and it is happening really quickly. If you do it the other way around, if you come up with the design and then say, right, how do we implement it? That, that can have a really adverse effect. Absolutely, but, but that I think is that conversation, what is it we're building here? Yeah. And really explaining it to people and, sh and, and giving them examples and showing them uh, that, that if you're, if the, you're, those are just two different things. The site that's kind of banged together with functionality in mind is one thing, and there will be situations where that's absolutely fine. Uh, because you can get hung up on being desperate for it to look perfect on every form factor. Maybe it really doesn't matter. But so I think you have to make sure that what you're building is fit for what the, what the business requirement that the client has and not to, as I have done in the past, I'm sorry, when working for Delali Development, I have occasionally missold Drupal by claiming it's really quick and easy to do stuff. Uh, you've got to be just careful about uh, write a good sales proposal where you very carefully put caveats in that explain these points, kind of like the small print. So at least you get some point to go back when they say, I thought we said, you can say, no, that's not actually what we said. Uh, I gave, and be, uh, also be ready to give, not that people read documents, but give them to them anyway. So on these various points that I've made, actually write a document that explains it because you'll be able to reuse it. And then, at least, if they, can, if they say, well, nobody told me about this, you think, oh, yes, we did. Uh, it wants, uh, yeah, people's capacity to deny what they've been told is almost limitless. So it won't get you out of every hole, but it will reduce the risk a bit. Well, sorry, just one slight small addendum. Uh, I'm sure some of you will already know about it, but there is a book called The Mythical Man Month. And, yeah, the stuff in it is, is from a particular age. But the knowledge, the intention is ageless because it's all about people. Uh, it's, 
Yeah. Sorry, what, what was that called again? The Mythical Man Month. Okay. Yeah. Originally written in 1960s, it's, it was an update in the 90s. But as I said, the technology side of it doesn't matter because the important bits are about. Yeah, I'm interested to know where in the process of the beginning you would have the difficult conversations. Because obviously it's a conflict with uh, trying to sell and trying to to uh, get a contract when you've um, got competition yeah. for that project. Okay, so what I would, the way I think that this would work is, uh, and, it, and it's not easy, is the, uh, in the sales process, what I'm saying over there is put some, put some stuff in there that gives you get out clauses. Get your most miserable developer to read your sales proposal before it goes in and put yellow lines through all the bits that say, oh, that'll be hard. Make sure that you do get somebody else to check it so that at least you put some caveats in there, riders, the small print. Then when you get in, you've, been, you've made the sale because you've just, I mean, making a sale is usually by, is by connecting with people, but you've got to then be fairly upfront is you put together a guess at what it is you think you need, and I wrote a guess about how we think we might do it. And I used to be really open about that at the beginning and say, uh, now let's get real. Now, in terms of how you would set it up, you would have to prepare that. So go on site before doing the onboard, full onboarding session to say, this is our method. But I think you'll find that actually saying we taking a risk-based approach with any serious client, they should, they should buy, they should buy into that. Yeah, of course, but it's not the first thing. No. So you go, you go at first, you you prep it, and you say we take this stuff seriously, and you you set up sessions. You probably don't do what I've just done as the first session on the first day. You're all together. Yeah. Uh, do it, do it as the second session. Do the first session where you're actually saying, so what is it we're going to build then? Yeah. Uh, and then, but do drop into this stuff. It's so easy to kind of let it go at the beginning because you're all friendly and happy and they're really relieved they've appointed somebody. But the point I'd make there is at the point when you've been appointed, that's your point of maximum power because they don't want to go away and go somebody else. So at that point, you've got authority and everything you can do for it there will either reinforce it or dissipate it. So right then, you can be fairly blunt. Um, yeah, this is all fine and great for the next project. But let's say I have an existing project and it, it started off in the wrong foot. What would you recommend to do any that? Well, if you can, one thing I'd say is, uh, I think the biggest mistake can be to just keep trundling on. So if you feel you can, Find somewhere in the, uh, find a point of contact within, at your customer's end where you actually go to them and say, we're in trouble here. Uh, and actually just kind of put your hand up. Because one, uh, one of the other things that kind of characterizes most people is they, if you throw yourselves down vulnerable, most people are actually uh, going to be, they don't, they don't respond aggressively at that point. If you try to deny it and say you're in trouble, you might be in trouble. So it's going to make it worse. So I'd actually say, as a prof just your professional judgment says, look, we've hit risks that are going to block your project, and I, my jo job as your supplier to go and try and tell you. I think that's what what I'd say. But I know there are times when you're working with impossible clients, or and at that time, the other thing I'd say is sometimes just grit your teeth and push on through. You know, we all screw up, but uh, sometimes that's all you can do. Just uh, on that point, I thought I'd uh, share a favourite problem of mine, which is about how far you are down the wrong road to turn back. Nice, yeah. And if, yeah, if something's going wrong, there's a reason for it. And actually, it, it, I mean, sometimes it just takes stability to tenacity to just see something through and just stick through. But at the same time, there's a systemic problem. You can't put this out. You actually need to do it. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, that, yeah. Which you've you've expressed why I was mumbling about much more eloquently there, yeah. And I think we're done on time. If it, okay, well, uh, thanks very much for that. This is an awesome like, thanks for everyone coming to the camp. So we encourage everyone to go to the social media and to the Facebook page.
the social night tonight at around five o'clock. This is the no, location is a flat split and it's all being made It's around three minutes walk from here. So yeah, because of the sponsor by Thunder, so we have a, a thousand pounds on the tap. So feel free to go and you got some free beer. Yeah. Did, did anyone get that over there? There's a social night tonight, there's a thousand pounds behind the bar, and Thunder of the sponsors. This is the flat split and toffee maker. Yeah. Okay, we're done. Thanks. I probably haven't <laughs> watching the cell phones, <laughs> but I don't think I, I don't think I said anything too abusive about an, about an no, actual no, customer. No, that's fine. Um, you mentioned any customers. No, no, I did. Um, I did once do a Drupal talk in a, a camp, and they were videoing it, and I had to contact them the next day and said, "Do not publish that video." <laughs> yes. Um, the mythical man month written yeah. by an ex-IBM guy uh, who's uh, oh, know, really um, well, you know, he was, was fairly high up in IBM um, uh, at the time. And, um, he was a project manager and of course at, you know, in the 60s and 70s it was a time when people were just discovering how computer stuff happened and what, what was what. Um, and he was in charge of some really, really big projects and noticed that, you know, adding people to the mix didn't oh, yeah, help. Yeah, yeah. So it was, you know, because some people had the idea, well, you know, if I've got three devs doing stuff and I need it to happen twice as quick, I need six devs and that's fine. And that's not. <laughs> it must it doesn't you, work. You must have heard the... You know, it takes one woman nine months to baby. Nine women can't wait to in a month. That, that's a restating of the... Essentially, that's a restating of the thing that, that this guy came up with. Uh, so, anyway, it's, it's, it's a good book. Yeah. It's a good book. But as I said, it's all about people. It, it's, it's not the tech, and you can't mm. fix the problems with tech either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is such uh, a problem for you know, our industry. <laughs> How to make waves that have the right sense of any mix. Oh, okay. So it's written by a lady, she had a tent as well. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> essentially, what it says is she thinks the entire book is about the communication of the teams. And it's aimed at seeing something that may be more than I've taken some stuff from it. Yeah. Work, like the intention document, so it makes sure that's what the intention is going to be. Okay, yeah. That's also recently been implemented by the use of yeah. t-shirt styles. Mm. So if it's a really, really big thing, use the right shirt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Using that, but it's an amazing book. Cool. <laughs> no, no, no 